Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, a podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger, and we've just finished a series on Deborah and Barak, and now we're moving on to the next major judge in Israel, who was Gideon. After Deborah and Barak sang their song, there were 40 years of rest for the land, and then Israel once again did evil in the sight of the Lord. And that is where we pick up with Gideon. So, Greg, take it away. Tell us the story. <laughs> tell you the story. Well, I'll kind of storytell and kind of read. The Lord delivered Israel into the hand of Midian seven years. Midianites were relatives. They were descended from Abraham's son Midian by his third wife, Keturah. So there was, there was close relationship here. They should have been friends. And some of the Midianites had been friends. Moses' uh, father-in-law was a Midianite prince, priest. But more often than not, they were a thorn in the side. And so God hands them over to their cousins, as it were. And the um, Midianites come in like swarms of grasshoppers. They're eating everything. They're abusing the natives as they find them to the point the children of Israel made them the dens, which are in the mountains and caves and strongholds. Mm -hmm. so, so we talked like, about cave people before. <laughs> yeah, well, this seems to be one early example of cave people. And the way it's worded is interesting. They made them the dens, which are in the mountains and caves and so on. Apparently, these dens and caves were well known to a later generation. And so it's sort of like, Grandpa, why are there kins, caves and, and holes in mountains? Well, let me tell you, son, it was back in the days of the Midianites. So, <laughs> um, yeah, they, they not only found caves, they made them caves. They made dens where they could hide when the Midianites swarmed in. And with them, we're told, the Amalekites, the children of the East. Uh, the Amalekites at this point, depending on how you slice and dice Egyptian chronology, probably were still in charge of Egypt uh, and, and, and were possibly until the days of King Saul. Because remember, the Amalekites, uh, God had pronounced perpetual war against them and said he would wipe them out. But he waits 300 years until the end of the judges to finally send Saul to deal with them, which suggests they were someplace that Israel couldn't get them. Like, well, the one place they were forbidden to go, Egypt. Uh, so Egypt the Amalekites... Are Egyptians? When, or... Egy when Egypt fell, when God wiped out there, let's see, cattle, <laughs> crops, army, heir to the throne, <laughs> drinking water, uh, national treasures, slave, removed their slave labor and broke their confidence in their gods, the uh, Israelites leaving ran into the Amalekites and chased them off. Joshua, it's where Joshua had his first experience of war. They had to go someplace. And Josephus says that the people who took Egypt took it without a fight. It's a little mm. unclear as to why. But that would be the time when you could say, I mean, there's no army, there's no king, there's no heir to the throne, and they're sick, they're dying, they're dead. Uh, it'd be a great time to go in, like a bunch of vandals, a bunch of barbarians, and just establish yourself for a while. But to say all that, we run into Amalekites here. What's going on? Well, probably these are mercenaries because mm -hmm. the focus is on the Midianites. But, you know, armies hire mercenaries. When uh, we were fighting our war for independence, the British hired the Hessians because most of the British people didn't really want to serve in the war. So King George whistled for some of his relatives in Germany and got German soldiers. There are usually mercenaries available. And of course, these particular mercenaries were people who didn't like Israel, and Israel didn't like them from way back. So, you know, this did not help things any. It might be that maybe some mercenaries don't care and just are there to fill their belly or their pockets or whatever. These mercenaries would not have been nice people remotely. Okay, so sorry, one more question about mm -hmm. Amalekites and the, the Egyptians. So yeah. when we look at Egyptian history, when we make Egypt our frame of reference, mm -hmm. do we find an Amalekite dynasty or we what find, happens we in find Egypt? We find some group of people called shepherd kings, Hyksos, ah. who come out of the desert. I remember these yes. people. Okay. <laughs> come out of the desert, take over for quite a while. <clears throat> 
The, the question is, did they actually stay there for 300 years? That seems to press it. But whatever happened, for some reason, God waited the 300 years. Maybe maybe God just wasn't ready because Israel wasn't ready because they were still in their cycle of disobedience and revival. Uh, but when, And then Egypt goes back into the hands of ethnic Egyptians? At some point, it builds itself okay. up. Right. And at some point, God says to Saul, there are the Amalekites. Go get them. And he almost does, but not with complete success or complete eagerness. He spares Agag, the king of the Amalekites. And uh, even despite his semi-best efforts, Amalekites linger on. We find them at the time of his death, both on the battlefield and har harassing David's men. And David deals with them. They seem to kind of drop off the map for a while until the book of Esther, when Haman mm -hmm. is said to be an Agagite, that Agagite. is a descendant of Agag. He's an Amalekite. So this is a battle that goes all the way to the end of the Old Testament. They seem to be descendants of Esau. At least Esau had a son or grandson named Amalek. It's a little strange <laughs> to mention that and it not be the Amalekites that we care about. So it's a subset of the, the older brother who isn't happy with us and can never be satisfied once all our stuff theme. <laughs> so anyway, they're they're in here. They're not a major factor, but it does kind of uh, assault the whole thing and say, well, we've got uh, Midianites who are kind of family and maybe we, oh, wait, they're hiring Amalekites. Yeah, this just went from bad to horrible. So they come up and they destroy all the increase of the earth. They take all, they left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. They came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. Well, mostly to take the stuff. And I, I am reminded of Bug's life here. <laughs> the uh, sun grows the food, the ants pick the foods, the grasshoppers eat the food. Well, that's kind of how it was for Israel. They grew the food, and Midian left them alone. And they harvested the food, and Midian left alone. And it was time to eat it all. Then they came in and took it all and left. And left Israel to go through it again. And the Midianites, or Israel tried to hide what they could, but it was it was tough because these guys were very thorough. They tore everything apart looking for any little trace of food. So God's people are starving. They're poor. They're put upon, mistreated, beat up, oppressed. And eventually they cry unto the Lord. Now, the, the cycle that goes through the book of Judges usually involves repentance. Later on, God just passes by that one and says, look, you guys are so rich. I'm going to save you even though you haven't repented. We'll worry about that later. But at this <laughs> point, we're still doing God's waiting on the repentance. In fact, when they repent, God sends them a prophet. There, we, we've heard of a few prophets here and there along with, of course, the patriarchs are called prophets. But this independent office of this covenant lawyer, the spokesman for God, this man with access to heavenly counsels who comes and delivers a thus saith the Lord by divine inspiration. Not so much. The judges themselves, although filled with, filled with the spirit and, and blessed by God for a particular labor, generally didn't prophesy. So this prophet shows up. He's not named. We don't know who he was. And he delivers God's message, which amounts to, um, thus saith the Lord, I brought you up out of Egypt from the house of bondage delivered you from the Egyptians and all who oppressed you. And I told you, I'm the Lord your God. Don't fear the gods of the Amorites, the Canaanites, in whose land you dwell, but you've not obeyed my voice. And that's where it ends. Apparently the prophet, you know, slams his book or whatever and walks out. Uh, that could have gone better. Uh, wait, God, isn't God supposed to forgive us or something? Hey, prophet, uh, there's not more to the... Oh boy, we're in trouble. But despite God's apparent turning away of his face, he's at work elsewhere. And the story continues thus. An angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord, comes and sits under an oak tree, which was in a place called Ophrah, that pertained to a man named Joash, an Abizarite. And he has a son, a grown son, uh, named Gideon. And Gideon is threshing wheat by a wine press. Now, Practically, the reason is to hide everything. Uh, you don't want to display before all of the spies and the agents and the soldiers that might be wandering by, even your neighbors at this point, that you got food. 
So he's threshing what grain he's been able to, to salvage and grow in the secret depths of a wine press. But something else that's uh, significant when we talk biblical theology, biblical imagery, these are images we come up against a good deal. The wine and the wheat, the wine and the bread, the threshing floor, uh, the wine press. This is where the image of those places where God confronts his people and, uh, to quote a former student of mine, smushes them, <laughs> rings them a little bit, crunches them a little bit, stomps on them a little bit with his gentle blessed feet so that we can be better than we were. We can become out something useful, something beautiful, something tasty, something that he will delight in. And so the uh, scripture brings, and, and God by his providence, brings these two things together. So Gideon's threshing, threshing the wheat, and the angel of the Lord says to him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. At this point, Gideon does not seem to know who he's talking to. Uh, <laughs> who? <laughs> yeah, what? You were there he looks right behind there. him. Yeah. Who are you talking to? <laughs> you know, yeah, and me? What? You're talking to me? You're talking to me? He says, oh, my Lord. And it's a, a, con a generic term of politeness. He doesn't quite get who, he, who this is yet. If the Lord, if Yahweh be with us, then why is all this befallen us? It's, and this is a real question I think that Christians struggle with. In mm -hmm. fact, we, we kind of dealt with this in Bible study the other night. If God is with us, then isn't everything going to be great? <laughs> and, but, you know, we're, God seems to have abandoned us. He's not saying it's God's fault or that there is no God. He's simply saying, if you by with us, you mean he's here to bless us and deliver us and, and save us. Not seeing that. He goes on. Where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, did, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So he acknowledges that Yahweh is their God, the true God, and that he overrules the affairs of nations, not only Israel, but the surrounding nations. And that they're in their current condition because God has forsaken them. The implication would seem to be that he understands why. They have not obey God. They've not kept the covenant. I mean, the prophets already told them, you've you've rebelled against me. You haven't served me. You've gone after idols. No doubt word of that circulated pretty fast. And Gideon is left saying, but you're saying God is with us. If you mean God is omnipresent, no kidding. That's not <laughs> helpful right now <laughs> because God sees the depths of our heart. God sees our sins. Him simply actually being metaphysically present is more of a problem than a help. <laughs> we, um, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout all the earth to behold the good and evil. Well, they're seeing a lot of evil right now. And we're not seeing any of his rescue. We're not seeing any of the miracles of salvation that our fathers told us of. So, it's curious yeah. how many times in scripture you have a statement so directly of Yahweh is with you. Yeah. I mean, it's almost the way it's used as a greeting here is almost like, can can we say this is, <laughs> hey, I'm here. I'm like, here. <laughs> this is the angel of the Lord. Does, is this identification with Yahweh? Meaning the Lord is with you as in right here. That's me kind of a thing. Am I reading uh, too much into it? No, I, I don't think you are. I, it, it doesn't have to mean that. But once we find out and once Gideon finds out who this is, <laughs> then reading back into the words, it's like, oh. Oh, you that's, really meant Yahweh that's, that's, is that's here. What, that's what you meant. I, <laughs> okay. I, I, I kind of missed that. Because, you know, a prophet or a pastor could say God's with you, Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. But... Yeah. Um, yeah, at this point, he still doesn't know who he's talking to, the Lord. And and the language of Scripture shifts now from saying the angel of the Lord to the Lord. Mm -hmm. The angel of the Lord is his messenger, and yet he is Yahweh. He is distinct from Yahweh, and that he, yet he is Yahweh. So this is the, the Logos, the eternal word, the Son of God. This is Jesus. The Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might. What might? <laughs> not seeing a mic here. Well, the might is that God is with them. Mm -hmm. They have, but he has to believe that. And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? At this point, I would assume that Gideon's getting a little suspicious. 
Because he's not saying, um, hasn't God sent you or aren't I sending you on God's behalf? He said, I'm, I, I, I'm sending you. I've sent you. Is that the fact that I have sent you is enough for you to know that you're going to be a savior, a judge, a ruler, a deliverer? And Gideon says, Oh, my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. So he's a Manassite, descendant of Joseph through Manasseh. And I am the least in my father's house. It may be that he had older brothers, or certainly had uncles or something. Some, there was an extended family, and he felt like he wasn't all that much. And apparently, actually wasn't. He didn't stand out. He wasn't charismatic. He wasn't known for his wisdom. He wasn't known for his battle prowess. He's the guy who's hiding and trying to scrape together some food for the family. At least he's busy, and he sees a job that needs to be done, and he does it. There's not much else going on here. And the Lord, Yahweh, said to him, surely I will be with thee. Okay, there it is again. <laughs> I'm, I'm the Lord, I'm with thee. And thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. They're, gonna, they're never going to know what hit him. It's going to be like one guy took a punch and knocked him across the room. And he said, if now I have found grace in thy sight, then show me a sign that thou talkest with me. What? <laughs> he, he, at this point, he seems to be getting really close to understanding, and he wants some kind of, it's not clear what he wants, but he says this, depart not hence, I pray thee, until I come unto thee and bring forth my present, and I will set it before thee. And he said, I will tarry until thou come again. The word for present is the word, same word that's used for the tribute offering. It can be used of a tribute to a king, a gift to someone more important than you. It's the same word that Jacob used when he sent gifts to Esau to mm. calm him down and win him over. Mollify uh, him. Mollify him, yeah. So, well, let's see what he, what he brings. Gideon went in and made ready a kit. This is not the work of five minutes. He didn't pop something in the microwave. <laughs> this, this took a while. He made ready a kit, a kit of the goats. And then 11 cakes of an ephah of flour. Oh, there's ephah again, which is three pecks. We found it in Bible study the other night. I still don't know, <laughs> yeah. what, still don't know what a peck is, but it's quite a bit. Um, so he's, he's Isn't made, a peck like a short kiss? <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> and um, so he's making a lot here. And he, um, the flesh he put, so he has an ephah of flour. The flesh he put in a basket. He put the broth in a pot. And brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it to him. So it's a meal, apparently, but a meal presented as a tribute or perhaps as a tribute offering. See, we, we still don't know exactly what's in his head. We don't know if he realizes this is the angel of the Lord or is afraid it might be or suspects it might be or what, whoever it is, it's somebody pretty important who can speak for God. And so he, the angel said, take the flesh and the 11 cakes and lay them upon the rock, this rock, and pour out the broth. So we have here the flesh of a sacrificial animal. We have the um, grain offering, the, the, the cereal offering, tribute offering. And we have a, a drink offering poured out on top of it all. So he's doing standard priestly worship stuff. He's not a priest, but the angel of the Lord is there overseeing it. And then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of his staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the eleven cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened cakes. In other words, the angel oversees the sacrifice, lights the sacrifice, and so as God receives the sacrifice. Worship is begotten. God has, through his son, through his angel, has moved Gideon to begin to renew the formal worship of Jehovah, of Yahweh. And the angel vanishes. When Gideon perceived that he was the angel of the Lord, so this seems to be the, the point where, oh, however suspicious he may have been, this is the point of realization. Oh, no. Alas, O oh Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. He, he knows that seeing God is usually kind of scary. <laughs> and uh, he does not feel up to it spiritually. I always wonder about those people. If only I could see the face of God. No, you, you don't want that. <laughs> not, not yet. And the Lord does, does the voiceover. Peace be unto thee. Fear not. Thou shalt not die. 
just gave him a job. Obviously, he's not going to die at this point. <laughs> uh, Gideon's kind of a fraidy cat all the way through the story, but he grows in courage as we go along. Kind of like uh, Samson's father, too, right? Yeah. We're going to die. No, honey. You just <laughs> said we're going to have a baby. <laughs> uh, yeah, very much like that. The, the two are very similar. In both cases, the angel of the Lord appears. In both cases, they want to bring some kind of gift. In this case, the angel says, pour it on the rock, and he lights it. In the other case, as I recall, they light it, but the angel steps into the fire and smoke and identifies him with the himself with the sacrifice by rising up in it. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, and in both cases, the guy says, oh, no, I'm going to die. In the case of Samson's dad, Ma Samson's mom is there, as you say, to say, no, honey, you know, we just got a job. So, yeah, it's not. Come on, it's okay. Uh, Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom, Lord of Peace. Unto this day, it is yet an Ophrah of the Abiezerites. So, Something has come up in different contexts. I don't know if we've ever talked about it. I think my wife has mentioned it a couple of times. We see throughout the historical books, we see God's people raising monuments, hmm. but they are almost always made of unhewn stone. They're rocks piled together. We don't see them carving statues of men. There's nothing in the law that says you couldn't, although perhaps given that culture, it would be wise not to, because most statues of men were, in fact, idols. <laughs> so probably they just didn't do that, really. But we do see uh, God's people often setting up altars or standing stones or taking stones that are already there and plastering them or writing things on them. So we do have in Israel a culture of remembering the past by setting up things that point to the past. And we're told, in time to come, your sons will say, what mean ye by these stones? And that's the opportunity to answer them. And so there was none, none of this, let's destroy culture now. It was rather, let's perpetuate a culture across generations and use monuments of sorts to do it. But in a culture where images of, of people often were simply idols, they Israel at least avoided it at this point. Uh, but they still they still set up these things. They preserve this altar. Now that that's doubly significant because Israel was not supposed to have multiple altars, but mm -hmm. since God sanctioned this one, apparently they figured that they could leave it standing, and they called it Jehovah Shalom, Lord is peace. Came to pass the same night the Lord said to him. So after that uh, rather stunning introduction, God comes back, or rather speaks to him. We're not told that there was a theophany accompanying. So apparently Gideon hears a voice that says, take thy father's young bullock, leaving the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove, the Asherah pole, that is by it, and build an altar unto the Lord thy God on top of this rock in the ordered place, and take the second bullock, the younger one apparently, and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove of the Asherah pole that thou shalt cut down. So the complicated instructions, but it basically means your dad's got a couple of bullocks, uh, animals qualified to be sacrifices. Take the younger one by passing the older one. So, you know, that firstborn, secondborn thing going on. And use the strength of the, of the bull to pull down the old altar, the one to Baal, that your father has. It's a family possession. So his father is a Baal worshiper. And apparently um, the community as a whole resorted to this. He was the family priest for the community, it seems. So you're going to do that. And then with what's left, you're going to build an altar to the Lord in place of it, on top of, of the remains. Then you're going to take the bull that pulled it down and sacrifice it. And you're going to take the, weir the uh, wood of the Asherah pole. That was Asherah was, or Asherah was the uh, female counterpart to Baal, the female fertility goddess. And you're going to use that to burn up the sacrifice. In other words, we're just going to trash the, the religion of Baal here very thoroughly. None of this equal time for Baal. None of this, um, well, everybody has their religion and we should respect theirs. This is an all-out war on Baal worship within Israel, which God claimed as his own. Gideon took 10 men of his servants. Now, Gideon had said that, that my house is small and I'm the smallest... They had 10 servants, you know, so maybe a little. <laughs> Small is a relative term. <laughs> Small is a relative term. And he did as the Lord said. 
So it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city. He could not do it by day. He did it by night. So he does obey, but he gets help, which maybe he really needed. And he does it by night because he is actually afraid of the rest of his family and the people of the city because they have some kind of interest in this thing. But he does obey. He may not be Rambo or Charlton Heston or whatever, or Tom Cruise. <laughs> uh, you know, the, the, he's, he's not Captain America. He's not bold and brave and out in the open, dressed flamboyantly with shield and sword and hammer. He, he, he's sneaking around. But, you know, when you tell 10 guys, we're going to do something that's going to get everybody ticked off, so please don't tell anybody. Yeah, that never works. <laughs> Ten people can keep a secret when what? Nine of them are dead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, they weren't. So, In the morning, the men of the city rose, and they, behold, the altar of Baal was cast down. So we're seeing kind of over their shoulders. Look, it's it's, it's been destroyed. <laughs> it's and gone. It's gone. And the grove is gone, the, the, the sheer pole. And the second bullock, he apparently didn't clean up the altar, so the remains of it were still there. And they began asking around, who did this? And as they did, someone said, Gideon, the son of Joash. Yeah, that didn't take long. Well, <laughs> they're very upset because, again, they have a vested interest in this nature worship. And it is nature worship. We need to be very blunt about that. They're worshiping the powers of nature. Baal is... The, the the male masculine side of nature, the thunder and the lightning and the rainstorms and the wind and all the violent, powerful stuff. Asherah is the female uh, reproductive nature of the womb of women and of cows, the fertility of the land and all of that. And when the male and the female get together, smash, then fertility, fertilitous stuff happens. <laughs> uh, there are crops, there are calves, there are little lambsies, there are babies in the womb. But it takes a bit of magic to make all that happen because nature's not always nice to you. Thus, Baal worship, the coercing, fondling, nurturing, needling of the powers of nature by magical means to get the uh, order, the natural order you need to have a productive, safe, and happy life. And when that magic gets disrupted, then you there may not be food next year. And given the condition that things were in, Baal was already not doing his job very well. Uh, probably a lot of people had tried the uh, the lies of, well, the reason that we're not getting much food is we've been neglecting Baal. We haven't been taking care of nature. If we fed nature, nature would feed us. So yeah, maybe there's this, this Yahweh person someplace in the background, some kind of therapeutic deism, as someone's called it. <laughs> You know, this 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 absentee landlord god person. But what it's really about is, is the forces of nature. We need to marshal them. And whether we call it science or magic, either way, we're borderlining on Lewis's prediction of a materialist magician. Because it's that kind of philosophy. So it's the, the, the world is out there to be manip manipulated. And it's not a particularly rational universe. And so if science works, that's great. If magic works, that's great. Child sacrifice, okay, whatever it takes... Just let us see the cause and effect. And getting, you've just interfered. And uh, we, sorry, we must kill you now. The men of the city said unto Joash, Gideon's father, Bring out thy son that he may die, because he hath cast down the altar of Baal, and because he hath cut down the grove that was by it. You know, oftentimes parents, the children are not the ones to instruct their parents in the faith, as I have learned over the years. And it's generally my advice to young people, my, my parents don't believe what should I do. Probably nothing but live out the Christian life before them. If you've told them once what you believe, generally God doesn't have children evangelize their parents. Not, it's not absolute by any means. And there are, you can think of cases where it has happened, but mostly parents look upon children as children and not knowing nearly as much as they do and not really having sound mind and so on. And so God usually respects that order and lets someone else witness to the parents. And to this point, uh, Gideon's dad has been a Baal worshiper. The, the, the altar, or the, uh, the yeah, the altar to Baal was on his territory. He was taking care of it. He was tending it. He was responsible for the Asherah pole. And when people come and say, we have to kill your son now because basically in terms of their religion, he's an idolater. He's killed the of sacrilege. He's torn down our altar. He's attacking the cultural norms of our society. Joash does the unexpected. He says, Will you plead for Baal? 
Will you <laughs> save him? Uh, somehow in a flash of realization, he realizes how absurd this is. <laughs> They're here trying to defend their god. Uh, wait, that puny shouldn't god. Be, yeah, puny god. I haven't used that phrase in a long time. One of the better things to come out of the Marvel movies. <laughs> <laughs> the other is there's only one god, ma'am, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't dress like that. <laughs> you know how much flack they got for that? They oh. they they got a lot of flack for looking down on nature gods. <laughs> well. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> Imagine that, yeah. They thought they were safe. They were mistaken. Uh, in fact, I remember once um, reading through the letters to the editor. I think it was either for Thor or Avengers back when I collected such things. Someone had mentioned something about, you know, the Norse gods as a thing of the past. And someone wrote and said, what are you talking about? These are still living gods that there people still worship today. I being one of them. You should show more respect, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> You're kidding. That that's right I, up there. Yeah, I know some of these people. <laughs> <laughs> that's right up there with uh, when there was a survey taken in Britain a while back asking people their religion, and a significant percentage listed their religion as Jedi Knight. <laughs> you know, <laughs> come on, guys. Um, so, you know, and, and Augustine picks upon upon this in the City mm -hmm. of God. Yeah. Um, when the Romans said, well, our whole problem is we gave up our gods for your god. Your gods? You mean the ones that you the had ones to- The ones you rescued from Troy? <laughs> you rescued yeah. from- Sorry, I interrupted you. Troy. No, that works better that way. Yeah, you rescued <laughs> from Troy. Uh, Aeneas had to carry them, protect them. These are the gods you thought we're going to say. And that, that all of that comes together here. In this question, will you save Baal? Will you plead for him as a lawyer pleads for a client? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death while it's yet morning. He's invoking the covenant law. God says that idolaters should be executed. Uh, you, ought, If Baal's a god, he's a false one, and you're champions of a false god, so you need to be executed. Anybody ready for that one? And apparently Joash had such a standing in the community that people backed down with that. He goes a little further. He says, um, if he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. Therefore, it reminds he me how people sometimes mistake the growth of a ministry for God's blessing on it. Like mm. Mormonism and Islam are two of the fastest growing religions in the world. That doesn't mean yeah. God's blessing them. No, it's it's like it's like this guy has been waiting around and thinking. Well, Baal must be powerful, otherwise his altar wouldn't still be standing or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but now it comes. Now he's convinced. He changes sides very quickly, and that day he called Gideon Jerubbaal saying, let Baal plead against him because he has thrown down his altar. It doesn't come across very well in English because literally this name means let Baal plead. And without the historical context, like, what? <laughs> um, let, let Baal ask for help, or I think probably our best equivalent is what you already suggested, puny god. Baal, <laughs> the puny god. Uh, you will notice that, that Baal is in his name, in this nickname. But it's in the context of Baal, the puny god. Baal, the god who has to rescue, who needs to be rescued. Baal, the one who should be saying something if he's real and obviously isn't. And throughout the rest of Gideon's story, we go back and forth between calling him Jeroboam and calling him Gideon. Do we know what Gideon means? Uh, yeah, I, I, I thought you maybe saw me turning in my Bible. Uh, <laughs> no, I thought maybe I had frozen. Do we collectively? Apparently not. Does uh, according to my Bible dictionary in the back of my Bible, Gideon means a hewer down. Hmm. And it, it adds in parentheses of men. That is a warrior. Okay, wow. that's, <laughs> that's interesting. So he's going to hew down the Asherah poles before he goes and hews down the Amalekites as one man. And that, I think, is where we're going with this. We're not, well, we're almost to the end of, of this section we want to talk about tonight. Uh, his battle against Baal starts not with the Midianites. It starts in his backyard. Mm. It starts with his family. It starts, first of all, with himself. Will mm. he have the courage to worship God? 
uh, even though it's not publicly acceptable right now, even though it can get him anything from cat calls and insults to beat up to really thrash soundly to when he crosses the line into attacking uh, the worship of Baal, it can get him killed. That's where it has to start. Peter says judgment begins in the household of God. And if it um, begin first with us, then where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? The uh, Paul tells us that if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged, 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, it, it is very easy, and I've lived long enough now to see this, for Christians to bewail the great evil powers out there that are trying to take over the planet, the deep conspiracies, the Satanism, the, the movements, the philosophies. But when you turn and ask them to maybe go to two services on a Sunday or to take up regular Bible reading or to lead their families in worship every night or to tithe, uh, you get enormous pushback. They're ready for God to take out the enemy. And sometimes we don't recognize the enemy. As, as Pogba says, we've met the enemy and he's us. <laughs> uh, we we have to, until we deal with ourselves, God is not particularly interested in the other. God can wipe out all the dark forces of humanism in an instant by any number of means, from, you know, asteroid strikes to bubonic plague to converting them all. He has all the resources he needs to turn history around to spin it on a dime. But he is more concerned with the individual holiness and sanctification of his people. And, and we find this, you know, people will find this hard to believe. There's, but there's all this evil stuff going out there, and all you do is talk about prayer and Bible reading and evangelism. Yeah. <laughs> Not all I talk about, but I do talk about it a good lo a, a lot. We've talked about it a lot here, too. We've mm -hmm. talked about the, the pagan philosophies that dominate our age. But if you're looking for some kind of asteroid strike to fix it or some kind of secret subversive society that hires a bunch of assassins, that's not how God does things. We, we, we have a real problem dealing with this thing that God's given us a weapon. It's called evangelism. It's called the gospel. And when we get our act together and when we make his priorities ours, God can deal with all this other stuff. Uh, and it may not involve us at all. It may be bubonic plague that sweeps through <laughs> some of our major cities and wipes out his enemies. Uh, or it may be that some street urchin witnesses to someone in power and leads him to Christ, and he turns around to his cabinet or his court or whatever and demands that they all start coming to Bible studies, and within a week they're all converted. You know, He can do <laughs> all kinds of things, mm -hmm. but we have to be faithful, not because he needs us, but because he wants us. He's after our hearts. He's after our commitment. And if it requires plunging an entire nation into darkness to wake us up and get our attention, he is more than willing to do that. Witness the last two years. Mm -hmm. And if we look back and say, oh, this is, this is proof that evil is ascendant. No, this is proof that God's not happy with his church. And um, if we want things to turn around, we better start searching our own hearts and our own ways and, and turn them to the Lord. And if we do... He's got it covered. He's not, his arm is not shortened that he cannot save. And, and this is what Gideon had to learn. Before he could take on the Midianites, he had to settle, first of all, his own issues. And he had to, he had to face his fears. And it didn't mean that he stopped being afraid because he goes on being afraid for quite a while. But he does what's right, even though he's afraid. And then he has to deal with the worship in his family. And contrary to everything I just said a minute ago, his first conference is dad which is very rare and unusual, not unheard of, but unusual. Uh, and then his village, because later on, when he, when he leads an attack, the first people that come down after him are the people from his tribe and his family. And again, most unusual. Usually a prophet is, without, is not without honor, except among those of his own family, Jesus said. Nazareth never, never got in line behind Jesus to support him. <laughs> um, but Joash's family will. And God uses this to turn things around politically and militarily, but it begins with Gideon facing the primary issue of worship. Whom do you trust and whom do you serve? And once you know that, you can answer the question, who are you? I'm the one who serves the Lord God of heaven and earth. I am a covenant child of God. I'm a born again Christian. I am a loyal soldier of Jesus Christ. But if you're not worshiping God, 
if, if you're not making him your priority, those are just words. And, and God doesn't take them seriously, neither does anybody else. People will generally laugh at you. <laughs> you're a Christian? Oh, yeah, right. And so God, God deals with things that are embarrassing to us. What do you watch on television? What are you doing while you're watching it? You know, who are you watching it with? Where's your wife? <laughs> you know, all kinds of things where we need to get serious about our faith. I, years and years and years ago, I wanted to write an article, which I never did, and that in itself is telling, called We Don't Want Revival. That basically, <laughs> I just summed up. We, we want revival for other people. Yeah, we, we want it out want there. That changes our hearts. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, with that, all the uh, all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the East were gathered together and went over and pitched in the Valley of Jezreel, place of decisive battles. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon Gideon. He's anointed by the Spirit. He blows a trumpet, or a trumpet, and Ebenezer, that is his hometown and the regions round about, are gathered after him. They come first. He sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, his tribe, who also was gathered unto him. And then he sends to the nearby tribes, messengers to Asher and Zebulun, to Naphtali, Galilee, again, the same place where Deborah and Barak's witness had been so strong a generation earlier. But then we run into the famous story of Gideon and the fleece, and we can save that for next time as we talk about Gideon still coming to terms with his fears and with Baal worship. He grew up in a household that believed that nature is in control and that God's some far removed Barthian deity. <laughs> and he wants he wants to be reminded and assured that God does miracles, that God is personally in control, that not only did he start things up and punch a start button and, and, and let the thing go, but that he personally runs the universe. He needs that reassurance. He doesn't, he doesn't throw out the fleece to find God's will. He's been told God's will. He wants to be reassured that his theology is correct. We mm -hmm. can say, well, he shouldn't have needed that. No, but God honors it anyway. God is very patient with us mm -hmm. when, if, even if by weak faith, we're putting one foot in front of the other, though it be with trembling. Yeah. And God doesn't deal with all requests for a sign in the same way. I'm I'm thinking of Zechariah in the New Testament. <laughs> we just talked about this with the fifth graders last week. Of, yeah. You know, he's not the first person to say, okay, how shall I know that what you're telling me is really going to happen? He's not the first person to ask for a sign. But the angel knew that this was a question <laughs> asked in doubt. And that was... Yeah. The sign that he gave was in accordance with that perception. Uh, yeah. 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 There, there the comes Lord a deals time with us as individuals. <laughs> as yeah. individuals. Okay, I know where that's coming from. And no, you don't get a sign. Other <laughs> people get signs. Jesus' uh, contemporaries ask for a sign. He says an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. Uh, it's a, a generation that is moved by sensual feeling wants sensual evidence. And Jesus said, I'm not going to give you any of that. Oh, except for one thing, the sign of Jonah the prophet. I'm coming back from the dead. What do you think of that one? But they did not They did not fully understand at that point. And when he did come back from the dead, they still refused to believe. But his disciples well, believed. Yeah. On that note, <laughs> mm -hmm. teaser trailer for next time when we talk about signs and fleeces. Yeah. Let's move on to some recommendations. Um, I think since you brought up Bugs Life, I'm going to recommend the classic Magnificent Seven with Steve McQueen mm. and oh, Yul yeah. Brynner. We yeah. watched the new one because, I mean, we enjoyed Chris Pratt and I don't know whoever else was in that. Um, <laughs> but the trailer that I had seen for it, or at least my perception of the trailer that I had seen for the <laughs> remake, had made it look like a comedy and it very much wasn't. <laughs> and like, it was a great movie, but when you're expecting a comedy and it's not, it's kind of, I don't know, it's not a great experience. You just kind of have to readjust. So maybe I should watch it again. But I do wholeheartedly recommend the classic, um, yeah, the original. Well, the original was hardly a comedy, although it did have some humorous elements in it. Mm -hmm. yeah, it had so. some heartwarming elements too. And, and yes, that too. Spoiler, not everyone survives. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was, I, I uh, wanted to show my class a Western because this is a generation that doesn't know what Westerns are. Yeah. It's been systematic. First of all, we just kind of forgot about it in favor of 
more recent things, war movies and then space movies and spy movies and all of that. <laughs> Toy Fox. Story all over again. The cowboy yeah. gets supplanted by the astronaut. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think there's a lot of truth in that. But so my class really had never seen a Western. So I played them that one. And I had never seen that Western. I grew up on TV Westerns, but I had never really liked uh, movie Westerns. But it was it was fun. The kids liked it. They appreciated it, I think. I think they had the same. Okay, we didn't see that was happening. And that's kind of sad. And Oh, well, that's kind of lame. But that happened. Oh, we feel sad now. Oh, but that was a good thing. So, you know, they got involved. But they that succeed in making you feel sad. <laughs> yeah, what, yeah. They, they, means they, the story was compelling. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Although, well, how much does it count as a true Western when it's based on the Seven Samurai? <laughs> yeah, well, the the whole cowboy genre arguably is based on knights and fair maidens from medieval legend. Uh, you have the knight on the horse. I mean... I, this, I don't re- know how much you remember of old TV westerns. There was one called Paladin, hmm. starring Richard Boone. He was a gentleman who lived in San Francisco, which was a gambling, carousing town right after the gold rush. And his emblem uh, that was on his business card was a chess piece of a knight. Hmm. And he, in the, song, the introductory song hails him as uh, uh, a knight without armor in a savage land. And it presents him that way, very self-consciously. This is a modern knight. Instead of a, a sword, he's got a gun. But aside from that, he might as well be a wandering knight riding words and wrong, except he got paid for it. The knights didn't always. <laughs> um, so, so, you know, there's all that. But uh, it, that would be an interesting study to go back and and look over. Mostly, I think, the introductory episodes of some of these Westerns and see what they thought they were going to do. Because they didn't always do that. (laughs) Sometimes what they had in mind really just didn't work. And after a few episodes, they realized that and and turned it in a different direction. Anyway, uh, I I have a semi-recommendation and it's qualified. It's a a series of books uh, by Rex Stout about uh, the detective Nero Wolf. (laughs) <laughs> my, my wife caught me earlier for dropping the L. Wolf. Wolf. <laughs> Nemo Wolf is a New York detective. He was active from the 50s, 60s, and so, whenever Rex Dad actually died. Then they had some author revive his work. But he's a big guy. He's a really big guy. He's a genius. But he's a big guy. He's so big and, and, and he's very eccentric. He never... Well, almost hardly ever leaves his <laughs> um, leaves his brownstone apartment, his off where his office is, and he has a very rigid schedule and very rigid rules. He has orchids up on the top floor, and he spends X number of hours during the day with those. And uh, <laughs> orchids are very demanding. Or- orchids are very demanding, and you get that very clearly. The story is told through the eyes of one Archie Goodwin, who is your more typical um, Seamus of that period. Uh, the guy with the quick with the fist and has the gun if he needs it. it, it it's interesting to watch Archie because New World Wolf is very educated, very refined. I mean, you got orchids on the one hand. He, he, he aside from Archie, he employs two guys. One is an or uh, an orchid master. The other <laughs> is a chef uh, <laughs> of international skill. And so along the way, as we're working our way through mysteries, we get we're introduced to things about orchids. Not something that's high in my list to want to know about, and so I don't pay that much of attention. But uh, as Archie learns about orchids, he also learns about the best foods. Mm. And so we are given the menu for breakfast, lunch, and dinner throughout. Oh, no. Is this a book that makes you hungry? uh, For things you probably can't afford and couldn't find if you could. Oh, that's the worst. (laughs) Yeah. He, uh, Archie has learned enough about um, gourmet food to be a kind of connoisseur and to argue with the chef over whether you should do this or that. But of course, the chef always says it his own way because he's a chef. But th- <laughs> this is the kind of book that my girls would like, and I'm going to start trying to steer them toward it because, you know, our family talks about food a lot, and the girls especially. <laughs> um, but So this is something you can read about murder mysteries, which um, my youngest particularly appreciates. and. Gourmet foods. And even though they're generally the recipes are not given, although a couple of times he actually sticks the recipes in the back. 
Um, <laughs> you can just just hearing what's going into this, the seasonings and the the strange elements that go to make these things is something to, yeah, set your mouth watering and make you wonder, how would you do that exactly? I'd like to see that done. <laughs> the, the one caveat, however, is unfortunately, Rex Stout's language is occasionally rude, crude, and on some occasions, he does take the Lord's name in vain. So my copies have a lot of black scratches through <laughs> So if people feel the less of me because I read this stuff, I'm sorry. But uh, <laughs> some they, other people might think less of you because you black the words out. <laughs> I, I know, and I'm sorry about that. But I, I you'll mean, get it on all sides. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but the mystery stories are good stories, and if you like a mystery for the sake of the mystery, for things that can, in theory, be figured out, it's good for that. Mm. I've I, I've come off reading. All my old Agatha Christie's, and for some of them, it's been 20 years since I read them. So I actually forgot them all. <laughs> so I got to I got to read them again and try to solve the mysteries again. And now with New Werewolf, I've read all these books before, but it's been more like 10 years for some of them. And so again, I'm okay. I, re I remember these things as they happen, but I still don't remember how it ends. So that's that's good. It's hard to find a good mystery. It's hard to find a good clean mystery, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, there's not much in the way of sexuality in these books. So in that sense, that's that's a break. So there it is. Um, Fair de Lee, I think, is the... No, Fair de Lee is not what it's called. Fair de... Oh, rats. It's the... I cannot tell you what it's the name of because that's the secret. It look, Fair de Lance. Oh, no. Fair de Lance. <laughs> okay. Now, if you happen to look up Fair de Lance, you'll find out what's going on. But if you just say, wow, that's funny how he misspelled Fair de Lee, then you'll walk right into it and say, oh, rats, I should have saw it coming. It was all in the title. Yeah, well. Yeah. <laughs> but it is a, it's a conventional mystery story, a whodunit, where you can try to match wits with the world's greatest detective. And uh, there are rumors that say that he might just possibly be the son of grandson of Sherlock Holmes. But you never know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds fun. Well, thank you so much for this conversation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, Emily. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lovely wedded husband. Uh, thanks to you, our listeners. We appreciate you tuning in. If you'd like to get in touch with us, feel free to send us an email. Uh, you can reach us at haltingtowardszion at gmail.com. Uh, you can also like our Facebook page. I think we're still on Facebook, theoretically. <laughs> um, we're also on YouTube and Rumble. You can follow us there or on your favorite podcast catcher. Also, big thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Uh, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Thank you so much for listening. See you next week. <laughs>